Hey friends, welcome to another episode of Not Your Mama's Podcast. The title of this episode is Preparing Your Body for Pregnancy. In this episode, we are speaking with Dr. Fiona Tassoni, who is a registered doctor of Chinese medicine specializing in fertility. As a fertility coach with a master's degree in Chinese herbal medicine, 21 years of medical practice, and over 32,000 hours of clinical experience. Fiona is the founder of the Pregnancy Accelerator Program and the director and the founder of Solaris Health, which is a leading fertility health center for acupuncture, traditional Chinese medicine, and herbal medicine. It is such an honor to have you on, Dr. Fiona. I can't wait to dive in to the topic today. Um, I know I've gave, you know, a little bit about your background, but can you explain to the audience a little bit more about yourself so we can get to know you? Yes, yeah, so I'm a doctor of Chinese medicine. So what that means is that I'm an acupuncturist and I'm also a registered herbalist. So we usually have those two banners uh, to call ourselves doctors of Chinese medicine. And uh, I've been practicing for over 21 years now. And I got into Chinese medicine through a back injury that I had when I was about 15 years of age. And I had chronic back pain and a posterior disc bulge. So I had chronic pain for about six years and tried all different modalities of health and healing and trying to fix this pain. And I saw chiros, physios, osteopaths, kinesiologists, GPs wanted to give me opiates and nothing actually fixed it, not structurally or, or not dissipate the pain. So anyway, I was living in London. So fast forward six years and still suffering with the pain, working as a legal PA in London in, um, yeah, back in the late, late 90s. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually had acupuncture in London as a last resort. I was like, you know, as a legal PA wearing these three piece suits and these stilettos, probably not the best attire for back pain. But I walked down Tottenham Court Road, turning to Good Street and saw this little Chinese medicine, uh, you know, apothecary store mm -hmm. and walked in and thought, wow, let's go in and have a look. And I asked him about my back pain and he said, have you tried acupuncture? And I said, no. So I had acupuncture for the first time when I was 21 and uh, I had two sessions of acupuncture and it fixed my pain. So that what is what inspired me to you know start reading about Chinese medicine the Tao Te Ching became my bible <laughs> and then I just couldn't get my hands on anything but Chinese medicine I wanted to know about Taoism and philosophy and you know the world that has no weaver there's all these great books so I was actually really well versed in Chinese medicine before I even studied it so in the final two years that I was in the UK, I had applied to come back to study Chinese medicine in Australia as a mature age student. And uh, that's how I began my career in Chinese medicine. Oh, I love it. And so the Chinese medicine, are those like the little white, the little white balls and you like put under your tongue? No, that's homeopathy. So oh, that's okay. The, okay. What is, what is the difference? So Chinese medicine, we work with herbs. Okay. And usually roots and tubers and medicinals, and we put them in a prescription and you can boil them up. Sometimes they're compressed in little balls that you can put under your tongue, similar to homeopathy, but different. It's still energy medicine. You know, we're still working on the energy body, but, you know, um, homeopathy is, is basically taking uh, a, a herb, for example, and then di it's making a dilutation of that. Mm -hmm. So Chinese herbs works completely differently so we don't okay. dilute it and but we combine so many herbs in a prescription so you can drink them or you can have them in granules or you can have them in those little magic pearls I call them <laughs> yeah no it's crazy because herbs and all these things are so good for our body but once they like became um I forget like you know the Rockefellers the oil-based stuff they said yes. they basically said herbal medicine is you know, junk. And then we have to focus on this model. And yeah. it is amazing how just the things we eat can cure us. We don't really need to be taking all these pills. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I, that's, that's what I do in my practice is I love to use food as medicine. So in Chinese medicine, not only are we taught about all the various properties of the herbs, we learn about nutrition and how that acts on the body. So we we use food as medicine in our therapy when we're prescribing 
formulas and you know dietary strategies and nutrition and all night lifestyle tips for people to overcome illnesses and prepare for fertility preconception all that kind of stuff yeah well perfect diving into the topic today preparing our bodies for pregnancy now i know that we are having like a global decline in sperm and that is part of preparing ourselves for pregnancy our partners need to be well equipped to impregnate us so what are your thoughts on that can chinese herbal medicines cure this um what what do you have to say about the global decline because if we don't have sperm then we can't prepare our bodies to get pregnant well, you know, when I first started practicing, primarily, it was really a focus on the females. And over the last 21 years, I've watched the decline of sperm systemic, systematically. And, you know, if you look over the past 60 years, there's been a 50% decline in sperm in, in all the parameters, be it volume, motility, morphology, and count, all those parameters, it's just globally declined. And it's across, not just humans, but you know, the animals as well. So we've got to really look at it and break it down and go, well, what is the cause? You know, they, there's a plethora of reasons what it could be. And, you know, it's not just one thing. Sometimes it can be hormonal. You know, a lot of the time I'm seeing uh, guys with testosterone deficiency mm -hmm. and lack of, a lack thereof. So we need to boost testosterone. And there is, there's a number of ways that we can do that with the herbs. We can also, you know, get them to see andrologists and do HCG injections or testosterone replacement therapy. There's all these different strategies now with hormones and doctors. And, you know, we, have, we often work as a team. Mm -hmm. So there's hormonal issues. There's also structural issues. You know, you might, might have guys that their testicles may not have descended. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so then you take it one step further. So what's happening in the development of men and their testicles? Well, you can look at chemicals like phytholates and BPAs. These are all you know, chemicals in plastics. So, and we're, we're actually, I think last week we saw uh, a study done with the first study done on um, plastics found in breast milk. So it's in our you know, bloodstream, in our blood, in our breast milk, which is really like, oh my God, microplastics in the breast milk. So We've got a problem with chemicals in our in our waterways, in uh, in our plastics, in our you know our food. Um, we've got glyphosate. So these this is the pesticides that they spray on all the you know all the grains and things. So that is a big problem. That's really fragmenting the DNA of the sperm. Mm -hmm. And you know if you just look at if you eat rice and quinoa and wheat and you know it's on everything yeah so Monsanto's dry, really got their hands on the farmers that's right and so they're not going to go um, I mean it's it's really sad because once it's in the grains it's in the waterways it's it's in it's all of us so I would say that that's a big part of it the chemical issues um you've got then stress which is that insidious thing that you know, we're, we live in a fast food Formula One mentality nowadays, and it's just like short black, let's go, coffee it up. That's the first thing we think of. It's just like so adrenal. It's like this cortisol based reality. And sperm is like, it needs to be cool. You know, that's why your testicles are actually four degrees cooler and they hang off the body. So men's testicles are heating up. We've got to cool them down. So, you know, things like wearing boxer shorts. Um, you can even get thermostat and check your testicular, testicular temperature and just make sure that it's four degrees below your body temperature. Can you ice them? Can you put the ice ice pack on those balls? Well, I wouldn't suggest that because, you know, <laughs> ice, <laughs> it sounds like a really smart thing to do, but no, because, you know, what ice does is very contracting and we don't want to contract the, the sperm we, we still need the motility we need that sperm to swim in a direct forward line that's your progressive motility so ice is going to really interfere with that so no it's not so much that but it's taking out the the mobile phones out of the pockets yes it's taking the laptops off the lap so they're not cooking the sperm you know I had a patient he was only in his early 20s orthodox Jewish patient of mine and he literally was putting the laptop on top of his lap I don't know, for 15 years from the time he was knee high to a grasshopper. And he literally cooked his sperm and we had to fix that. And uh, 
yeah, so I, these are just things that, you know, you can start doing straight away. Mobile phones out of the pockets. Yeah. <laughs> laptops on top of a table, you know, just away from your lap, away from your pelvis. Um, you know, you can have an autoimmune disease. You know, there's a rise in thyroid disorders, lupus, Lyme disease. There's all different autoimmune diseases now, rheumatoid arthritis. So, um, and then they could just have diseases like diabetes or high blood pressure. You know, they might have a really bad diet. So, you know, it, you can see how complex this is. And yeah, you, totally. Well, you almost need to unpack it. And that's why that's why I love Chinese medicine, because that's what we do. In a case history, we'll unpack this. We'll go, right, what's your lifestyle? What's your sleep? What's your hydration? Show me what you're eating in a day. And you know, where, where do you, where do you, do you, are you on the computer? You know, what's your work style like? Are you constantly on your phone? Is your mobile completely in your hand all the time? So it's, you know, once you unpack it and you can start to see, you know, you may have grown up and your, your, your mother put you in a, a bubble bath every day and it maybe stopped your testicles from descending from all the chemicals in those products. Mm. So yeah, I've got this a beautiful woman, Arena Webb. She's uh, she's uh, on Instagram, but she she reads labels and she'll go into you know looking at your products and you know you can work with her and download her free downloadables. But it's really important to start looking at your shampoos, your makeup, your skincare, what you're using in the shower to clean yourself. You know all these products that are meant to be safe for us a lot of them aren't no they're not um well I know that like there's a lot of chemicals that are illegal to be used over in like the European states but they're legal here in the United States what are your thoughts on like lavender for men because I heard like using like lavender products kind of takes away like testosterone and things like that like have you ever heard anything about that no, I haven't heard the heard of that. No, not not at all. But I'm I'm also I'm not uh, into. I mean, I'm not an expert in essential oils. I do love lavender for people that have anxiety or mm -hmm. sleep disorders, and I'm a big fan of diffusing oils. You know, particularly in this process, you know, people are anxious, people are stressed, people have a low mood, and I will often prescribe lavender for that. So whether it's like putting it a couple of drops on the pillow or in the bath, I tend to prescribe it as an adjunct. I'm not an expert in that area, so I can't really comment, but I haven't heard a correlation with it affecting testosterone. Okay, yeah, no, I had heard it from like um, another kind of like homeopathic doctor, you don't want to use lavender too much on the boys because it right. kind of like, I don't know. That's just what I heard. I don't have any science background behind it. I just thought I'd okay. ask um, but so now kind of switching over to women and yes. preparing our bodies for pregnancy, you know, we need the other half of it. Of like what, what can you say about that? Like what, what can we do to prepare our bodies mentally, physically, emotionally? Well, I think both, when you're looking at both male and females, mm -hmm. you know, if you look, sperm takes about 74 days to mature and reproduce. So you need to commit to it's three months. It's the same with egg quality. You know, you have a primordial pool of eggs, and they for them to be released and develop and mature, it's about three months. Mm -hmm. So I always say to couples when they're starting to conceive, we need to kind of take three months of preconception as a minimum, and ideally three to six months. In an ideal world, I'd be looking at twelve months. <laughs> And no one has time for that. They want to get pregnant now. No. They want to get pregnant. They want it now. now. I know. So as a bare minimum, so I try and break it down. So as a bare minimum, you need to commit to three months of, you know, looking at your diet and lifestyle, looking at perhaps, all right, let's just clean it up a little bit. Let's remove maybe some gluten. And because I find a lot of people when they remove gluten, it does help with you, your ability to digest things. And I'm not saying that everyone's celiac and has a problem with wheat, but it's because of the glyphosate and all the chemicals that are on our brains. So I tend to go, all right, let's just kind of take wheat out of the equation, dairy out of the equation, all these things that create inflammation in the body. So, and then it's like reducing the sugar. So they're the three main things. Then it's like, let's reduce our caffeine intake. Ideally, I'd like it to be zero, and I'll give you um, alternatives like Ticino or Raza coffee, all these adaptogenic 
coffees that you can have now that are made with medicinal mushrooms and, you know, figs and, you know, barley, chicory, uh, you know, even things like cacao. So there's lots of different strategies you can use that don't involve caffeine and that will give you some, some bang for your buck like ashwagandha, which is a really nice uh, adaptogenic herb that's like coffee, but it's good for you. So it's going to lower that. the cortisol. <laughs> yeah. So Raza coffee is amazing. So, you know, I tend to give people lots of alternatives, even dandelion tea. And even if you if you really like the caffeine, then I'll say, let's try green tea and start to wean you off slowly. Um, but it's just literally applying some of these formulas. Hydration, you know, <laughs> H2O. We need that for sperm, but we also need that to mature follicles. And so I find most people are probably drinking half a litre like 600 mils of water a day and we need to we need to like triple that yeah. <laughs> quadruple that yeah so we need two liters as a minimum so you know increasing the water intake exercise um you know even if it's 30 minutes of walking a day you want to just do what inspires joy i love that so if you're not into walking if it's karate if it's whatever it is pilates yoga bike riding just make sure that you're not riding for more than 30 minutes for the testicles you know we don't we don't want to squeeze them and make it all tight there so you know bike riders need to pull it back a little bit um but again things like wearing boxer shorts staying out of hot tubs and you know so we're not cooking the sperm yeah um, and then it's like using breathing techniques i find meditation is such I mean, it's such a, a modern day thing that we talk about, but how many people apply it? So I teach people really simple, basic techniques where they'll place one hand on their heart, one hand on their womb or their pelvis, and I get them to learn how to breathe into their belly. You know, singers and opera singers, they breathe like this. It's called live, do lower diaphragmatic breathing. Mm -hmm. And what it does is, is it lowers cortisol. It calms the nervous system. It's so good in this fertility process because most people are high in cortisol. They're stressed down. And so what I've got to do is come in and reduce the cortisol, reduce the stress and increase the oxytocin, which I call it the God hormone. It's mm -hmm. the love hormone and it's a balance. So really it's just about finding the balance in what you're doing. Yes. Sleep is another parameter. If you've got, you know, we've got to fix things. So a lot of people, if they've they've got insomnia or anxiety, then you know we've got to fix these things. So then your body can optimize, it can absorb things, it can, you know, use the nutrients that you do eat, and then make better blood and better sperm and better follicles, better babies. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hey friends, I hope you are enjoying this week's episode of Not Your Mama's Podcast. This podcast would not be possible if it wasn't for the support of you, my wonderful community. To support your mama's podcast, please click the support link right down below and you can donate just as little as 99 cents. Also, follow me in the Shop Like to Know It app where you can follow me with all my exclusive content all the way from baby products I love, fashion and style and everything in between. Now let's get back to the episode. No, it's so true. When I was trying to conceive for my second, um, I, it just wasn't sticking. But my husband was going in the sauna every day for like 45 minutes. And yeah. I'm like, you need to stop the sauna. And he stopped. And it took like three months until he stopped. And I actually did a some type of diet my friend was doing. Um, and I really did cut back on gluten and things like that. And I ended up getting pregnant. Um, yeah. but I mean, it was just not working with him frying his, his little, yeah. his little swimmers. Yeah. And I'm not talking about, it has to, it doesn't have to be a radical fad diet. I'm just about nourishing your body. Like mm -hmm. I think a lot of people think, oh, I've got to go on a radical paleo diet or this diet or that diet or FODMAP and, and it gets so complicated. I need you to understand that you need all your macros. You need good quality carbs, good quality fats, good quality protein. Now, these are the building blocks to make good quality embryos. Mm. And you need them in the right ratio. See, a lot of people are really undernourished on the carb front. You know, we need carbohydrates to ovulate. 
Yeah. <laughs> we need proteins of the building blocks, you know, for us to grow a human. And we need those things. And so many people don't eat enough protein. So I will come in structurally and just see where you're deficient and just say, let's nourish our bodies with better versions of things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're denying something, and a lot of us have this you know, using food as denial and we beat ourselves up. There's a beautiful book called Women, Food and God by Janine Roth. I love that book. And it's like, it looks at humans. We're either permitters or restrictors in this book. It talks about at what we're like. And so I try and take us out of being a permitter and being a restrictor and just go for nourishment. Let's come down the center line. Let's, let's follow the Tao, the middle path. And let's not just be one or the other. Let's just find a really healthy balance of nourishing the food and nourishing your body and in just being one with your food being happy when you eat you know have, have joy when you eat yeah, celebrate i love eating it's yeah, a celebration exactly. and make make every meal a meditation so if there's people that make you stress don't eat with them try and avoid eating with the computer at the workplace in front of a mobile in front of the television you know there's i want to take the distractions out so we come like become like almost <laughs> shell in monks where we we become one with the food and we smile on the inside we eat slowly eat in silence and look at nature when you're looking at nature and the trees and the birds and listening to the sounds of nature you actually slow down mm -hmm. and i get people to even slow down how many chews per mouthful so I, when I first observed myself chewing and swallowing food, it was, I was inhaling my food. It was six <laughs> chews per mouthful. Now I say to my patients, you know, the Shaolin monks, they have 36 chews per mouthful. So oh, meet wow. me halfway. Yeah. 12 to 18 chews per mouthful. So observe yourself when you play an observer's role of observing how you chew and do this with your husband, watch him chew and see if he's a really fast eater slow down slow down I'm a fast eater I'm actually faster <laughs> than my husband <laughs> yeah. and I eat more than him <laughs> yeah. so do I. but the Wait one thing is is like I sometimes don't I'm standing up and I'm eating because it's like I'm, the kids are sitting down I always got to like get up and help them and I mean I know I definitely need to sit and enjoy my food more I'm, I'm just standing up to eat just to eat to feel full and I'm not enjoying it as much as I should so that is a really great reminder yeah absolutely and there's simple things that you can just apply so you know that that's the beauty of Chinese medicine it's not complex Chinese medicine breaks things down into the simplicity and that's the beauty of what I love working with this because you can relate that information to your patients and they go oh I can do this so then you become your own doctor mm -hmm. no it's very powerful to be able to be your own doctor and cure yourself without having to like get a prescription or do things like that and, and in a in a holistic natural way I mean people were doing that for centuries before like imagine if we were as children growing up and we were told how to use food as medicine what the medicinals in the in you know our, our 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 garden is our garden of Eden. It's there to nourish and help us, you know. And and what we eat with in food is far superior than any vitamin. And we have this attachment to vitamins and supplements and give me the pill. Yeah, it's like no, it's out there in the garden. Just open your eyes, look out, reach out. Yeah, no, it's so true. And then I think our kids would probably eat healthier. You know, yeah. not having all these like factory made foods with right. chemicals. And, in you know, it. When, and when you cook, it's like another meditation. You know, when you chop the food and then you cook the food. When I was traveled to India back in 2006, so I, I'm actually Iyengar trained and I went to the Iyengar Institute to train with Guruji, uh, BKS Iyengar. And uh, when I was there, it was interesting that watching how they prepare the food and then you know they will eat with the left hand and you know um, use utensils with the right but they actually use their hands because it actually opens up part of our senses you know of touch and yeah. taste and smell it becomes a very sensory experience and I was blown away when I was in India we've got so much to learn from them oh my god I know I love all those like really rich cultures I yes. love that. Yeah, no, that, that probably was a fun trip. You know, my mom just got back from Egypt. 
Wow. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, I want to go to Egypt. You're so lucky. Yeah. It's amazing. I've been, I was there back in when I was in the UK and uh, they, you know, to ride camels around the great pyramid and just see the scale of it. It's just, it's magnificent. I, I mean, it's just, it's awe inspiring. There's not many places in the world that I've traveled, but the, the great pyramids are definitely one of those places that just literally take your breath away. Oh and yeah. Imagine, so imagine much history. Yeah, imagine seeing them like 10,000 years ago when they were covered in limestone. Like, imagine that vision. I mean, it would have been amazing. Oh, my God. Beautiful. So I have a question that I ask all my guests, and I would love to know your answers. I cannot wait. Um, The first one is, who and what inspires you? Maya Angelou inspires me and and it's probably a little bit cliche I know she's Oprah's mentor and uh, she's no longer with us but she's just this incredible poet that truly transformed my life you know whenever I was feeling down or sad or uninspired I would read Phenomenal Woman and I would read her poetry and it's always lifted my spirits And she's such a visionary, you know, she was an African woman's activist, writer, director, poet, you know, she ticks every single box for me as not only just an inspiration, but how she empowered women. So I would say she's had the greatest influence on my life. Perfect. No, yeah, I love that. Those go-getter women and they just, (laughs) you know, they just can do it all and they help inspire. I love that. Um, so my second question is, what is something you wished you knew when you were younger? I wished I knew, I guess it's a difficult question. I think I wished I could reach out and ask people for help. Like, you know, cause as a little person, I never put my hand up. I would always think that I had to fix things and get, and, and I knew the answers to everything. And I think as a little person, I wished I knew it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to put your hand up and reach out and receive the love and receive the gifts. Because I think my tendency has been always to just give and give and give and give and never receive. And I think that's not served me well. So I'm learning how to receive now <laughs> as an adult. And I didn't receive well as a little person. No, that's good. Yeah, you got to accept the gifts. You yeah. Gotta, you got to be open to it. I like that. Yeah, no, I remember when I was a little girl, I didn't really raise my hand that much either. No. <laughs> Whatever my insecurities were, you know. So I like to tell little people, it's okay to ask for my help. I'm going to give you so much love and so much nourishment and I'm going to be here for you. I just wish I reached out more. Mm. I wish I spoke up more. So I think I didn't have a voice when I was a little person and um, and I shut down this throat chakra. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm kind of sad for that little person that didn't didn't ask and didn't reach out and didn't put her hand up. But you know what? That little person's probably so so proud of who they became that's right that's true yeah absolutely absolutely um and then my third question is what's the essential part of your daily routine the essential part of my daily routine is waking up (laughs) and the first thing I do is hydrate 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 because I have to live and breathe what I prescribe to people And, you know, and this impacts my husband as well. And I've got him into it. So my first waking thought is to have some filtered water, two standard glasses of about 200 mils of water. And I add two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar, squeeze a fresh lemon Mm. and a pinch of cayenne pepper. And I do that every single day. And I've done that for about 21 years. Now, my husband he used to have gut issues. And since he's done that, we fixed that. It's incredible just how powerful and potent, such a simple thing to do. And if you apply the formula and do it every single day, it can change your gut and your microbiome. So well, I see you repeat it again. It's water. Yep. 200 mils of water. So standard glass of water. Okay. You know, I think you call it a nine ounce glass of water. Is that right? Nine or eight ounce, yeah. There we go. There we go. I've got to remember that. And then two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar. Okay. A squeeze of half a lemon. Okay. So I usually cut the half a lemon and squeeze it into those glasses mm-hmm. and use the other half of the next day. And then a pinch, like maybe a quarter of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper. And that helps your body absorb it. You can add some black pepper if you wanted to. 
Oh, nice. Black pepper, Try that. black pepper helps you absorb. So any form of pepper helps your body absorb things. Mm, that's good. And that goes for things like turmeric as well. So if you're using turmeric in your cooking, if you use black pepper, it helps your body absorb the turmeric. Yeah, I heard turmeric's really good. My husband used to try to put like turmeric in his coffee and all that stuff. Yes. Look, I did a post just yesterday on turmeric, uh, turmeric latte. I call it the golden milk fertility recipe. And it's using turmeric and ginger and cayenne and all these things, black pepper, coconut oil, and you make a latte. So instead of having a coffee, it's a turmeric latte. Oh, I love it. I just yeah. love all the, it just sounds like healthy and delicious for my body. <laughs> Without a doubt. <laughs> um, and then my last and final question is best advice you've ever received is to know yourself know thyself I mean it's written I think Plato said it I can't remember which philosopher said it but you know one of my greatest friends his name's Phil Thomas in New York I remember doing satsangs in the park these are these are meditation talks when I was about 15 years old where I grew up in country New South Wales in a little place called Dubbo and we would meet and do these meditations and he's just, he got us to meditate and tune in. And he's like, you've got to know yourself. You've got to know yourself and love yourself. So that's probably the greatest advice I've ever received. And I think it's the greatest advice anyone could ever receive because you really do have to know yourself and you do have to love yourself. And sometimes it's so much easier said than done. And that's what we're about here on not your mama's podcast is, you know, Whoever comes on to spark the inspiration to get to know who you are, to get to help, you know, maybe something to love yourself more or work through the battles that you're struggling with. Like, you know, that's why I love having like all different kinds of guests like you on. Um, Cause I know a lot of women are struggling with, you know, fertility or even men yeah. struggle all the time too. We don't talk about it that much. Um, you know, we well, always the World about- Health, Health Organization said there's about 186 million couples suffering with infertility worldwide. Mm-hmm. And it's very isolating. People don't realize that, you know, you're, you know, one in, that makes it well, one in three couples. Yeah. So you don't know who's next to you. Your best friend might be struggling and we need to kind of open up the conversation and, and really reach out and ask, tune in with your friends and your loved ones and ask them, are you okay? Are you really okay? Totally. How can I be of assistance to you? You know, cause really sometimes you just need to listen. They just need to talk about what they're going through. Being an active listener is the best medicine. Yeah, totally. I agree. Um, Do you have any last final words before we say goodbye today? Well, I encourage just anyone that's going through this infertility process to, again, know yourself, love yourself, find the ways that inspire joy in the process, tune in with each other, find each other's love language, start practicing loving kindness to each other and to yourself. Perfect. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Fiona, for coming on today. It was such a fruitful conversation. And I have all of her links down below in the show notes. Don't be shy. Go over there and say hi. And thank you guys for listening to another episode of Not Your Mama's Podcast. And I hope to see you in the next one. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Not Your Mama's Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. We really appreciate it, and we'll see you in the next one.